Tonight's program on an introduction to cultivating mindfulness to support recovery will be presented by Dr. Lib Libby Robinson. Dr. Robinson has practiced mindfulness meditation since 1979 and was trained to teach mindfulness-based stress reduction by John Kabat-Zinn and colleagues at the University of Massachusetts Center for Mindfulness. She is retired from the University of Michigan where she was a research assistant carrying out NIH-funded research on the role of spiritual and religious changes in recovery. She also did an NIAAA postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Michigan Addiction Research Center and was on the social work faculty at Case Western Reser Reserve University and the University of Buffalo. Please join me in welcoming Libby. Hi. Um, they, they said that I, that you should be able to hear me without a microphone. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, good. Uh, and if, if, at any, if my voice drops, which it can drop, especially when I'm, I'm going to be leading you through a couple of little meditations. Um, if my voice drops and you can't hear me, wave. Okay, I'll keep my eyes open. <laughs> but I'll know that that means, hey, <laughs> okay. And I'm a pretty informal presenter. Um, I'm fine if you have a burning question that you want to ask me in the middle of, of the talk, that's fine. Uh, we don't have to wait to the end. Okay, so we're going to, this is like an hour and a half introduction to mindfulness. You can cultivate mindfulness for most of your life. And uh, it, 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 it can be very helpful. And for me, it's been, um, very um, transformative. I was kind of an emotional basket case before I got into doing mindfulness, and now everybody thinks I'm calm, <laughs> which I mostly am, but I still get pissed off and sad and scared and you know all those other things, all those other variations on that. Um, but, but I'm definitely, um, I'm much more compassionate toward myself and toward other people. Whew. Let me tell you, it's much better than it used to be. Okay, so what is mindfulness? <clears throat> this is John Kabat-Zinn's definition. He's kind of the guy who popularized the mindfulness that you hear about all the time. And on TV, and Oprah Winfrey talks about it. Um, you can find it on the web. You can find John Kabat-Zinn on the web. Um, but this is his definition. It means paying attention in a particular way on purpose, so deliberately, in the present moment, noticing this present moment, just as it is, whether you like it or don't, um, and without judging. Whoa, without judging? Oh, come on. You know, the seat's uncomfortable, my dinner isn't sitting very well. You know, I mean, there's always something, right? Um, so, but can we notice that and then still be um, not, pile on. Can we even notice that we've judged and go, oh, I'm judging. Oh, look at that. I'm judging. Okay. All right. We just noticed that. It's really all about awareness and developing our capacity to be aware of our, this present moment, just as it is right now, um, including current physical sensations. A lot of current physical sensations are very mundane, um, and we'll be talking about that some more. Any thoughts? We live in our heads so much. Uh, emotions that might come up without judging oneself or one's experience, or at least without piling on the judgment, um, and without holding on to the experience or pushing it away. So what I'd like to ask you to do is, right now at this moment, what do you notice? At this moment, what do you notice right now? We could. Keep it at physical sensations. So what physical sensations do you notice right now? Yeah. There's something over there. Yeah, it's over there. <laughs> yeah, so we can notice hearing. What else do you notice? It's cold in here. OK, so noticing feeling cold. Glad I wore my sweater. What else do you notice? Yeah, right. 
<laughs> there's one of the I've done this I've done this talk before for Don Farms of one year I'd had something and I all, during the whole thing I kept noticing it <laughs> so like it's just oh, a little too much or something so any anybody else what do you notice right now yeah the lights yeah the lights are they pleasant or unpleasant unpleasant so another way to ask this question is what are you aware of you know um, which sometimes when we go, well, what do you notice? Your mind goes blank and you can't think of anything. Well, what if we ask it this way? You know, what are you aware of at this moment? Um, and now what are you aware of at this moment? Are you aware of something different? Maybe. Maybe you hear a sound that you hadn't heard before. Or noticing feeling toastier than you did before. Yeah. Squeaking chairs, so noticing squeaking chairs, right, right, right. And this moment. So noticing how after this moment, there's this next moment, and then there's this next moment. Moments just keep coming, you know? And so you can uh, spend a lot of time trying to be mindful, which is not a bad thing. Okay, so moments, this is my theory. I think moments of mindfulness are not all that weird, <coughs> rare, unusual. You know, you think about, a, uh, it was earlier this week, the sun was shining, and it was almost 70 degrees, and you went outside and it was like, oh, wow, oh, this is great, you know? So noticing that, that before we started thinking about it and analyzing it and talking about, oh God, now it's going to get cold after this, getting all depressed about it, or seeing that amazing red maple tree that you pass on every day on your way to work. My gosh, it's so spectacular. And then, you know, you think about something else. Um, so we can, you know, we, we have these moments all the time, but we don't usually stay there. You know, we start thinking about where we're going and what we're doing and how we're late or we're early or what did this person say or what should I do or it's all my fault or whatever, you know, we all pile on. Um, what's rare is persistent awareness of this present moment. That turns out to be hard to do. Um, this guy who's written a book, Dan Harris, he's written a book called 10% Happier. And his basic idea is that if we're 10% more aware, 10% more mindfulness, more mindful that we will be 10% more, 10% happier. Um, I remember at my first retreat, somebody asked me, well, how are you doing? And I said, well, I, you know, I was all defensive and kind of, well, I'm thinking I'm paying attention maybe 40% of the time. I was trying not to brag or anything because I really felt like I was just a dud at this. Um, and he was real impressed. So, I mean, you know, whatever you do, don't, uh, don't set your goal as I'm going to be mindful all the time. Make your goal more like I'm going to be more mindful. I'm going to be more aware than I am at this moment. Okay? That's a little more achievable, and you're not going to end up ragging on yourself so much. So, as we sit, I'm going to ask you to do this. Um, as we sit here tonight, for the next hour or so, just notice as best you can this present moment as they, as they unfold. And just notice, you know, no need to judge it. Oh, I like this, I don't like that. We can notice that we like it, we don't like that. Um, just notice where your attention is. Notice what you're aware of, okay? As we go through the, as we go through the, watching Libby wave her hands, watching Libby walk around, listening some, to somebody ask a question, thinking about the seats being warm or cool or whatever, okay? So just, you know, make that kind of a, a little mindfulness practice that, that you're going to do. And that's an important type of mindfulness practice. You can do that anywhere, and we'll talk about that. So this idea that sustained mindfulness is useful isn't anything new <coughs> or odd, or it didn't come out of John Kabat-Zinn's head. Um, in the 1970s, the ancient Greeks and Romans talked about it. And almost every uh, major religion has a strand that's about cultivating being present. 
Uh, in Catholics, there's something called centering prayer, which I've only experienced a couple of times myself, coming from the Protestant tradition. Quaker meditation, the Buddhists developed a lot of technology around how to do this, which is very useful. And then we also find uh, American, trans a lot of philosophers talk about this too. The American transcendentalists, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau of Walden Pond fame that you had to read in high school, you know. He, they talked about it too. They talked about just being present. Um, the thing is, and that's where I first ran across this idea about the usefulness of being present. The thing is, is that what I discovered is, yeah, Okay, that lasted about a half a day, and then I completely forgot about being present and being aware and paying attention. So that's part of what I'm going to try to give you some sense of how can you maintain this? How can you keep practicing and give you some tips on that? And then most recently, we've got Eckhart Tolle, who's not affiliated with any religion, as far as I know, and this just like came to him. He wrote this book, The Power of Now, bestseller, blah, blah. I, it, it doesn't do anything for me, but lots of people got a lot out of it. And he was on Oprah Winfrey and you know, all these other things. So he's, that's, that's out there. Mindfulness is not a religion. That's where, this is very deliberately is secular, non-religious. Um, it's not about putting ourselves into a state of bliss. Where we're you know floating on the ceiling and everything is hunky dory, you know it's not about that. It's not about a trance state. It's not about automatic pilot. It's not about just doing something in a rote way without uh, awareness. It's the opposite of that. It's not an empty mind. Some Zen people talk about emptying your mind, and some other people talk about emptying the mind. That's not so much what we're doing here. And when you really interrogate them about what do you mean by that, basically they mean that more of the mind is settled. There's a little bit less bubbling up, a little bit less uh, going on. Um, it's not that literally there's nothing going on. Joseph Goldstein, who's a very uh, well-known teacher in this tradition, uh, in the American Buddhist version, was asked once at a retreat a conference for scientists that I was at. One of the scientists said, do you think the mind is ever quiet? And this is a guy who's meditated a lot, a lot. And he's, mm, no. You know, it's constantly, you know, little comments about this or that or the other thing. The question is, do we get caught up in it? Does, it start, does that little comment start running the show? Um, do we have some choice? Uh, do, are we even aware that this, that this mind is running the way it does? It is not something to harass yourself about. Somebody wrote an impassioned article, column in the New York Times, about she felt like she was mindfulness, all this stuff about mindful parenting was just making her feel bad about the fact that she got mad at her kids. Well, you know, most parents do, you know. Your kids are not perfect. They're going to act out. They're going to do things you did when you were a kid, right? Um, so it, it's not something to harass yourself about it. You do what your best you can, and that's all we can ask of ourselves. Do the best we can to be mindful. And if sometimes I get pissed, ah, there it is. Okay, all right. Uh, hopefully, I don't. It doesn't get into a scorched earth policy where everybody around me is in, incinerated. <laughs> that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> it's not a cure for whatever ails you. Um, you know, you're still going to have cancer. You're still going to have heart disease. Um, you're still going to have to wrestle with an, with an addiction if that's what you're dealing with. Um, you know, life isn't a bowl of cherries just because you got into doing mindfulness. Uh, it's just another tool for helping you deal with the realities of life. It's not definitely not a quick fix. You got to work at it. You got to practice it. The more you practice it, the better you get at it, and the more accessible using mindfulness is. The more you're likely to to do mindfulness while you're sitting there at that three-minute stoplight. That you have that it's always red, 
when you get at it, right? You know, and you have to sit there and wait three minutes. You could practice mindfulness while you're, while you're waiting for the light to change. We'll talk about that a little bit more. That's one of my favorites right now. And it's not about passivity. It's not about, oh, it's OK. Whatever is going on is OK. Matter of fact, I'm better now at saying to, no, that's not OK with me. I don't want to do that than I used to be. I used to go, oh, this would be fine. And then I get into it, and it's like, ah, no, this isn't what I want to do. So it's a, I feel like I know myself better from having done this. OK. So this is a very brief summary of all the research that's been done out there. There's more and more and more research being done. They're now even doing brain scans of people before and after doing mindfulness, learning mindfulness. And we're learning more about what happens in the brain, even over the course of just the standard eight-week course. Um, but we've, we see reductions in depression and anxiety. And eating disorders seem to improve. Um, perceptions of stress, how stressed out I am, it's, and, and pain. And it's not like all those things are gone, gone, and we never experience them again, but more we now have a tool for managing them and for, no, for not getting quite so caught by them. Um, we also see increased immunological response. People who've taken a mindfulness course seem to respond better to a, a, a vaccine. Um, than people who haven't. Isn't that interesting? Um, reduced blood pressure, which is not a bad thing. Um, and cortisol. Cortisol is one of the stress hormones. So we, we want, and it's particularly problematic amongst <coughs> um, people, those of us with stress, anxiety, depression, who are dealing with substance abuse and that kind of stuff. Um, we see decreases in people using substances that aren't so good for them. Um, physical pain decreases. Mostly it's like our relationship to the pain shifts, and it's less dominant. It doesn't take over all of our attention, because we're more aware of other things that are going on besides the pain. Yeah, the pain is there, but what else is going on? The interesting thing to me is that changes appear to persist. You know, you take a pill, an antidepressant or whatever, and when you stop taking it, the effect goes away, right? Whereas with mindfulness, if you've practiced it, the effect is still there. You know, so three years after a, uh, a program to reduce stress in women with breast cancer, three years later, they're still uh, showing evidence that it's been beneficial to th for them. And these changes appear to happen just like over the course of eight weeks, which stuns me. Because you know, you think that, oh, I have to meditate for years to get a benefit that's going to show up on the, in the science. But that's not true. So that's kind of cheering, isn't it? So there's some, idea, there's some ideas here about, this is what the scientists are arguing about now. Besides, of course, they always want a better study and more different kinds of people, and that's good. Um, and measuring mindfulness better, they argue about that too. But they're also arguing about this. How does it work? Why does it work? Uh, and this is some of the ideas that people have. Attention regulation, we're regulating where our attention is. We're noticing where we're st where our, when our attention is stuck and we're shifting it. Still acknowledging whatever it is that's going on, but not sticking there, not being able to choose to shift the attention. Greater awareness of the body and our physical sensations is really useful. Usually, we're pretty oblivious. Unless you're, something hurts, unless your, your foot hurts, we're really not aware of our feet, right? And yet. Where's your foot right now? It's on the floor. Or maybe one of them is up in the air because it's crossed, you're crossing your legs or something. But normally, we're not very but aware of the body. But it's very useful, turns out. And then there's a whole category of stuff around what we're calling emotional regulation. Um, one is reappraisal. 
where we allow ourselves to interpret events differently. Oh, well, the fact that my friend who I just saw on the street and I yelled at her and waved and she didn't do anything, she didn't say anything, I could interpret that as she hates me now and she's never going to be my friend again and I must have offended her. Or I could go, huh, how's she doing? Is she okay? Where's her, you know, her, she, why is she distracted? What's going on, you know? Um, so that we don't give up on the relationship. Um, so that, in that sense, there's a sense of reappraisal. And then um, another thing that can happen in terms of emotional regulation, one of the things we notice um, that people talk about in my classes is that they're less reactive to emotional stuff when it happens. Um, and a little bit more even in responding to things in life. And I think one of them is this thing that, you know, a difficulty arises. We're sitting there meditating and we're thinking about mm, somebody at work who is really <coughs> aggravating, right? Or, or that really rude person in the store, the, the person who ran over your foot with their cart, or whatever, you know? We, that happens, right? Um, can we notice, but not react? <coughs> can we notice that that happened? We can even notice that it was annoying and that it was upsetting, but we don't have to blow up. We don't have to stay stuck there, right? And then it kind of dissipates, and we can choose how we want to respond. We can say, hey, you just ran over my foot, you know, instead of blowing up at them and creating more difficulties for yourself and for them. And then there also seems to be a shift in how we see ourselves that happens as we do mindfulness. One is um, this idea, one of the things I noticed after my first seven day silent retreat uh, was that I realized, oh, I'm not just this bundle of emotions. I'm not quite sure what I am, but I'm not just that because those things seem to come and then to go. So it's not a static, I'm not, that's not who I am. So my ideas about who I was changed. And that was really helpful, really, really helpful. Um, and the, one of the other things is compassion toward oneself and toward other people, which turns out to be really important and helpful. Um, and we'll talk some more about that as we go through this. It's not a magic bullet. Let me just check the time. Um, it's not a magic bullet. It's not going to work like this, and it's not necessarily going to be always available to you. You might still find yourself getting angry or being overwhelmed by sadness or um, being really scared. You know, that happens. Those things happen in life. So it requires a lot of patience. It requires a lot of practice. The more you practice, the more available this different way of operating in the world is to you. And being persistent. Because if you think about it, we're really creating, this is the neuroscientist-ish part of me talking. We're creating new neural pathways. Um, our, tradition, our typical ways of responding to people are a kind of set of neural pathways in our brains. When so-and-so treats me like that, I just, you know, there was a person at work. Every time I interacted with her, I get so pissed. And I couldn't figure out why. I mean, I knew I was pissed. But it took me the longest time to figure out what was going on. And then I, I was, Oh, you know, she's being really patronizing to me. And of course, anybody's patronizing to me, I'm going to get pissed off. I mean, it just seems to be this automatic reaction that I've got going. OK, all right. So I was able to not blow up at her because I needed to work with her. Um, but eventually, I got to the point where I thought, well, I could, you know, you know, what, what's really going on with her? Well, I realized that she was really trying to control everything and make it all work the way she thought it should work. And she just had this really dreadful way of conveying how she thought you should do things. 
And I also found out, that I realized that she treated everybody that way, except the most important boss. Yeah. Um, and I sort of started to feel sorry for her kids. But that's a whole other story. But you know, I mean, you, <laughs> but but you know, but but this is what I mean about how your perspective on somebody can change. And I mean, I still had to interact with her. And whenever I saw this uh, coming up in my own experience, I could choose to not respond. I could choose to not react in that kind of way. And maybe what I would do is, you know, I'd like to come back and talk to you tomorrow about this some more, and just. See you later, kind of thing. Sometimes that's what we've got to do. Um, I respect that about you, how you want to handle the situation. So creating new neural pathways takes practice. You know, how did you learn to drive? When you first learned to drive, it was not automatic, right? You had, you had to do, now you don't even think about it. It's just, it's an automatic thing. There's probably a nice little neural network in your in your brain, connecting all the different things that are associated with how we drive. So that's why repeatedly cultivating awareness and compassion is important in gaining the benefits of mindfulness. I use the phrase in my meditations a lot, just noticing. And you might even make that, you write it on a piece of paper and put it on your dashboard of your car or on your mirror, just noticing. Just noticing, gently, softly, with friendliness towards yourself and your mind, over and over and over. I like, I like this. I realize I've only been at it for five minutes, but meditation isn't bringing me the peace of mind I was promised. <laughs> you know, five minutes once isn't going to do it. You know, five minutes a day for a year? That could do it. That could really help you shift and make things a little bit different. Uh, and it also doesn't have to be meditation. It can be this informal practice that I was talking about, where we just notice what's going on right now in this ordinary moment of sitting here in this auditorium. OK. So I ran this by you earlier. So what have you noticed now? since I last asked this question. What do you notice? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yes, that's very true. And that's, that's where I think a lot of the uh, work is, the long-term work. You know, it's easier for us to, OK, I'm not going to blow up at this person. It's easier to do that than it is to never have the thought to begin with. This person is still annoying to me, this person. I don't have to work with her anymore because I retired. But. Yeah, she was still aggravating when I left. <laughs> um, someone else, yeah. Um, tinnitus, is this like tinnitus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, yes, I, I do understand. I have that too. Um, I, I think part of it is just, and other people, you know, I mean, it's, it's quite common. So one, one of the things, what I would suggest is, okay, there it is, all right. What else do I notice? So it's a two-part response to it. One is, oh, there it is again, acknowledging it, accepting it. And then the second part is, OK, what else is going on right now? You know, And maybe there's another sound that you might notice, or a physical sensation, or um, um, the breath. We'll be working with some with the breath in a few minutes. But there's, yeah, there's a lot of other things. When we start to work with the present moment, we discover how big it is and how much is going on in the present moment, um, which is really useful. But it's, it, is, it is something that, because I don't know about you, but <laughs> there have been times when this tinnitus thing has been like so irritating, you know, and I find myself getting really annoyed about it. And it, there's really nothing that you can do about it. They say if you have hearing aids, it makes it better, but I don't know that that's true. Um, but you know, it's it's just it's there. It's like an ache or um, uh, the fact that your cat's got colon cancer and is dying. You can't make that better, right? 
That's a fact. So can I acknowledge there's sadness around that, acknowledge that I am hoping that he will be okay, um, and that he'll stick around as long as he can. <clears throat> but yeah, this, so there's this, so there's this real important piece around mindfulness about accepting the present moment as it is, which is, can be really hard to do because sometimes the present moment really kind of sucks, right? You know, things going on that we really don't like. Somebody I meditate with in my house, it really drives her nuts that I have a, one of my lights on a timer and it sits there and goes tick, 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 right? Mm -hmm. And it drives her nuts. And she has to get up and she has to unplug it. <laughs> you know, so we can notice how there are things that happen to us in life that are really hard to deal with. There are things we can do things about and there are things that we can't do anything about, as we all know, right? We all know. You know, and, we're, and, and there are things, of course, in life that we can control. What's the serenity prayer? the things that we can control and the things that we can't and the wisdom to know the difference, right? And if there was something you could change. So like I said, what do you notice right now? You know, if, you, if it's helpful, you might close your eyes and just sort of notice any physical sensations I'm noticing right now at this moment. Tiredness, right, right. And how, what does tiredness feel like? I can kind of get a sense because you're sort of slumped over. And holding your head up, gravity is winning, right? Yeah, sometimes that's what's happening, right? So we can notice that sense of uh, exhaustion. What else do you notice? But, but if, you, if you close your eyes, let me ask you to close your eyes. If you're comfortable closing your eyes, you don't have to if you don't want to. But just noticing the body. So what do you notice? What did you notice when you brought your attention to the body? Is there tightness here, there? The heartbeat, you notice the heart beating, right? Do yeah. you notice the body breathing? Sometimes we can notice that. Do you notice if somebody said gravity? I assume, you know, you're noticing your butt on a chair, right? That's a pretty, that's a pretty uh, obvious uh, sensation. Do you feel like you're sliding forward? Right, yes, right, right. So, whoops. So what does this have to do with recovery? Um, I, looking, you know, I ran through all those different um, psychological states that are, seem to be helped. Um, being depressed, anxious, uh, recovering from trauma, um, things like that. Um, th those are co quite common um, issues for those of us who are dealing with addictions, with addictive patterns. Um, so this whole idea of becoming aware, become aware of the inclination to use and what's that about and am I, am I going for it because I'm tired? Am I going for it because I'm hungry or because I'm feeling lonely and I feel, feel like if I don't have a drink at this wedding that everybody's going to, that I'm going to feel like the odd person out. Um, so we can allow ourselves to be a little bit curious about what that's about. Um, so I th Becoming more aware of cravings before they hijack us. You know, there's this point when ah, the craving's taken over and boom, there you are. Um, so hopefully we become aware of it before we start to act on it um, with, if we're using mindfulness. And then, of course, you all know about, it used to be called HALT back when I was in the business of, but now I made it FAULT. Because it includes pain, pain, physical pain, you know, is an important reason why, why p people turn to using substances. But noticing pain, noticing hunger, anger, loneliness, tiredness before they hijack us, because those are kind of precursors to using. Um, and choosing other ways to cope with them than using. Choosing to look at things differently. Maybe my friend 
who didn't respond to me on the street, maybe that's, maybe that's not about me. Maybe that's just about her and where she's at, you know? Being willing to be, to entertain that possibility that is not about you. So not taking things personally um, is very useful. And choosing to not act on destructive inclinations that arise. And definitely moving to getting some support from the people that you know who do care about you um, and are available. Being compassionate toward yourself is really, really important, cultivating that. Um, and including your recovery efforts, even when there are failures or lapses or, you know, still bringing this quality of kindliness and friendliness. I mean, what would you say to a friend who relapsed? You wouldn't condemn them up one side and down the other, right? You'd support them to get back on the wagon. Let's keep going here. So this is a, a quote from a Buddhist magazine called Tricycle. Um, if we train ourselves to reach for a snack or pick up the phone to text message whenever we feel frightened or bored or angry or sad, um, this is training. We're training our brains, right? You remember I was talking about neural pathways? We're creating a neural pathway. The neural pathway is, I'm feeling bored, I grab the phone, I text my friend or I start playing a computer game or read the news or whatever your default is there, right? And then the next time that we feel badly, we do it again. Um, reaching for comfort outside ourselves. So eventually we establish this deeply ingrained habit and it's another brick in the wall. So we want to be okay with putting the phone down, leave it alone at my sister's house. You cannot use your phone at the dinner table. <gasps> it's a good habit though, you know? It's a good habit. It's definitely something I had to resist when I was at her house. So these are some of the changes relevant to recovery that can occur with mindfulness practice. We see decreases in craving, stress, anxiety, depression, PTSD symptoms. Um, Tony King at the VA, he's also at U of M Psych, um, is doing stuff around PTSD, and some other people are doing stuff around depression and anxiety. Um, decreases in thought suppression. Oh, I don't want to think about that. Well, you know, it's there, right? So, all right, I see you. Now I'm going to go look at something else. So this whole thing around acknowledging that something has arisen seems to be really important. Pain, perceptions of pain. Um, and then increases in acceptance, increases in acting with awareness, a greater awareness of bodily sensations, a greater ability to regulate our emotions, um, compassion towards self and other, and connect, feeling connected to others. Um, greater joy, sometimes it's not always easy to feel joy, but it happens, and a greater sense of purpose. And there's quite a bit of research, some of which I did, on how sense of purpose is associated with being able to stay sober. So sometimes, you know, creating a sense of purpose in your life can be a real helpful thing to do. Um, okay. So there's two, two ways, as I, you know, you can always argue about this, but there are two ways I think of as how we can cultivate mindfulness. One is through meditation, and I'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. But the, but the other one, which we've already been playing with here, is informally, being more present in our ordinary lives. Um, so, you know, we, we were talking about, what do you notice right now? The sounds, the sense of sitting here. Um, do you notice the taste of what you just ate? that's still a bit in your mouth, or about the last thing you drank? Um, do you notice any particular smells? You can actually kind of go through the five senses. What do you see 
right now at this point, if you see this blue screen, you see Libby waving her hands, you see the people sitting around you, right? So we can notice those things. What are you aware of at this present moment? And you can do that anytime, anywhere, right? You can brush your teeth mindfully. What do I notice when I brush my teeth mindfully? What do you, what do you think you might notice while you're brushing your teeth mindfully? Here's a toothbrush. Here's the stuff you squirt on it, right? The water. What else do you notice? What, the taste, right? right. Yeah, you're being uh, Yeah, right, 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 right. The weight of the toothbrush, whether you like the way it feels in your hand. There are all these little things that you might notice. And one of the things you might notice is the mind's wandering. I've caught myself reading a book while I'm brushing my teeth. I find brushing my teeth one of the most boring things in the world. It's okay. All right. Noticing being bored. All right. There it is. Um, noticing looking out the window at the neighbor's backyard. Oh, look at that. His hostas are coming in already. Yeah. So the important thing is to notice that that's what your mind is doing. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's what my mind is doing. Okay. And it's all right that it wanders off. Minds wander. That's another important thing to remember here. Minds wander, oh, all the time. So you can also eat mindfully. Um, in a smaller group, I would hand out something. Everybody gets a bite, something to eat. And it's not just putting it in your mouth, but looking at it and feeling it and smelling it. And maybe it makes noise. Um, and then maybe biting into it, seeing what it's like when it sits in your side of your mouth. What's it like when you bite into it? So really drawing out this experience of eating. And maybe your mind goes off into, well, this is, I just suddenly realized I really don't like Hershey's Kisses, you know? <coughs> okay, that's right, I really hate candy corn. You know? So we can notice, you know, we can just notice. I mentioned the traffic light. When you're driving, there's a tremendous number of things to pay attention to, right? You're holding the steering wheel. Maybe you're doing this or this. Maybe the window's down. You get your arm out. You can notice that. You can notice your posture. You can notice, is the radio blaring? You can notice whether the windows are open. You can notice the big red truck next to you, the guy behind you who's too close. You can notice being impatient. You can notice feeling maybe that you're late and I, I should have gotten here hours ago or whatever, you know. But you just notice, just notice. So those three minute traffic lights are really useful. A place to kind of just, oh, look at, look at what's, just look at what's going on. Just notice it, just paying attention. Um, making the bed, folding clothes, touching water. I'm not good at paying attention when I'm getting out of bed because I'll just get up out of bed. But going to bed, I'm better at that. I'm better at that. Okay. So any questions about some of these informal practices before we move into meditation? It's like I mean, one of the analogies I like is, you know, you buy a nice looking apple at the store, you bring it home, you cut it open, and it's all brown on the inside, right? Well, it's a brown, it's a rotten apple, you know? So at what point does my reaction to this rotten apple become judgment? When I'm yelling at myself about having bought a rotten apple, or when I'm ready to take it back to the store and tell them off, you know? I mean, you, you know, when, the, when it starts to get all this emotional charge behind it, as compared to just going, ah, darn, I was really looking forward to that. Um, and when, it, when we start piling on a lot of negativity, particularly personally directed, negativity that is personally directed, then I, that's what I mean by judgment. That's what we're trying to avoid falling into. And it still happens. You know, we will still find ourselves. But do we get caught by that? Pema children, um, I've never met her, but I'd love to 
to meet her, but she, she, one of her latest books is Don't Bite the Hook. You know, don't bite the hook. The hook is getting all upset because there's a rotten apple. Um, so just noticing if we are starting to get hooked, and maybe initially we will get hooked. Um, I think that we do become more aware of some of the things that drive us that we weren't ordinarily aware of. Like um, um, feelings of never fitting in, or feelings that nobody cares about me, or I'm incompetent, or you know, feelings like that that we kind of generally kind of keep down, stay, go away. I don't want to acknowledge them. And, and yet one of the things that can happen when you practice mindfulness is you become aware that, oh, that's what's going on behind that. And I don't have to pile on. I can just go, oh, maybe that's just a thought. Not all thoughts are true. This is a very important thing. Not all thoughts are true. OK? So you may, a thought may come to mind. But I don't have any friends, I don't, and nobody really cares about me, which is not true, but that thought can come up, you know? But it's not, it's a lot of thoughts that come up in our minds are not <coughs> facts. Um, and if we can kind of be open to that possibility that maybe just because this thought came up in my head doesn't mean that it's true. We can, be, we can start to entertain the possibility that, OK, that thought came up, but you know, I, don't have to, I don't have to bite the hook. I don't have to go there. I don't have to stay there. It might be important to acknowledge that it's part of, you know, and I could sit here and analyze it and tell you why it happened and how come I feel that way and how my childhood and all these other things. But, the important thing is, how do I behave in my life right now? And do I do things that are constructive and skillful and wise? I'm so much wiser than I used to be. <laughs> um, so I mean, that's what, that's one of the, th in the Buddhist tradition, mindfulness is thought to lead us to being wiser and also more compassionate. Um, and we can always use more of both. Um, we can always use being kinder to ourselves and to others, and we can always use being wiser and not quite so caught up in, um, in, 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 our, in our stuff. And lots of times these um, unconscious things are, uh, they're things that we have to acknowledge, but we don't necessarily have to act on them. We don't have to make that the driving force behind what, we, what we're doing. Especially if it's not a constructive, not constructive. Now, if it's, if it's a constructive thing that we've been squishing down that maybe we need to look at it like, I'd really like to be more creative. Oh, well, that could be something that might be useful, you know, to do. Um, anyway, we could keep going. And I can talk to you later about how I measured spirituality and religiousness. That's a whole other that's a whole other talk, which I did give at Don Farms a couple years ago if you want to go dig it up in the archives. Okay, so meditation. Um, what is meditation? This is a definition from psychology. You read it, you know, oh, a bunch of psychologists. It's nothing about connecting with the universe or God or whatever. Um, a family of self-regulatory practices that focus on training attention and awareness. Oh, attention and awareness sounds like mindfulness, doesn't it? In order to bring mental processes under greater voluntary control. Oh, OK. Notice that it's not about thinking about what's going on in the present moment. It's about noticing, which is a different cognitive skill than thinking. Where typically when we're thinking, we're trying to problem solve, or we're strategizing, or we're remembering, or things like that. So this isn't so much about thinking, it's about just noticing. Just noticing. Where is my attention right now? So there are lots of different kinds of meditation. There's concentration forms of meditation, which are 
you know, where you might maybe ex uh, two examples, really the, the attention is bringing the attention over and over and over again to one particular object, like a mantra or like your grandmother who does the rosary all the time, or maybe you do, you know, where there's this idea about bringing the attention over and over and over again just to this one thing, okay? And those are useful. Um, that's not my preference. I don't really, the thing is, is that they're, they're associated with trance states and gurus and I'm just like, Ugh. you know, I'm not, I didn't want to go there. So I got into mindfulness because people who teach mindfulness are teachers. I wanted a teacher, I didn't want a guru. And so I ended up going to a one week silent retreat um, and it's sort of like jumping into the deep end of the pool. But it was, but I learned so much. I didn't even like my teacher. She was so irritating. Um, but, but it was, I learned so much from doing it. I learned so much about my mind and, and what it did and how um, things came up in my awareness and then they disappeared. Oh, oh. And now this other thing comes up, and I'm really like hanging out there with this feeling, emotion, sensations, and then it goes away. So it was really interesting to start to become more aware of how things arise and pass away, and how impermanent so much of what we experience in life is, um, including all my ideas about who I am and you know all those sorts of things. Those there was a big shift there. Um, but it's much more about awareness. We do a little bit of concentration stuff in mindfulness just to develop some basic skills around focusing the attention, but we really are much more interested in being aware of this present moment. And then there's another whole category. This is, a, this is how I divide up the world of meditation. Um, then there's a whole other category of meditation like contemplative practices where we're deliberately trying to cultivate a particular quality like compassion or gratitude or forgiveness or something like that. And that's, um, you can do those in a mindfulness-y kind of way or in a concentration-y kind of way. Um, okay, so let's, let's go do some of these things. Um, so we're going to practice a meditation. Um, typically in meditation, you want to sit fairly square in your chair, but still be comfortable, OK? It's really important to be comfortable. So if you're more comfortable with your legs crossed, yeah, that's fine. Um, and just to keep us together, um, I'm going to ring the bell once at the beginning and then three times at the end of the meditation. So in this type of meditation, your eyes can be open or closed. It's up to you, whatever you're most comfortable doing. If you are more comfortable with your eyes being open, let them rest on a neutral spot in front of you because visual stimulation can be very distracting for the attention. And your hands can be wherever is comfortable for you. And just bringing the attention to the physical sensations of sitting here right now at this moment. Maybe beginning with the sensations in your feet. Perhaps noticing if your feet feel warm or cool. If there's an awareness of the weight of your feet resting on the floor. Is your foot flat on the floor or is the edge of your foot on the floor? might notice that. 
You might notice if you are aware of your of your shoes and socks. You might notice if you're comfortable, if your feet are comfortable or not, if your sensations in your feet are pleasant or unpleasant or neither, just neutral. You can just notice that. And then bring the attention up the body to the thighs and buttocks resting on the chair, noticing those sensations, maybe noticing sensations of warmth, coolness, gravity, pressure, weight. Maybe there's an awareness of where the edge of the seat hits the back of your thigh. Maybe not. If it's there, we can notice it. And then bring the attention to the back of the body, your back resting on the back of the chair and noticing those sensations. Maybe it's just a sensation of pressure. Maybe there are other sensations in the back, sensations of tightness or looseness or tingling or not. Sometimes backs can be achy. We can just notice if there's achiness or pain and just notice. You may might notice that some of this is pleasant and some of it isn't, is unpleasant. And now shifting the attention to the hands, wherever your hands are, whether they're resting on your lap or whether your fingers are touching or not, and just noticing those sensations, maybe an awareness of the weight of your hands in your lap. Noticing what the fingers are touching. They say fingers are very sensitive, the most sensitive, one of the most sensitive parts of the body. So just noticing if there's sensation of what the fingers are touching. Is it warm? Is it cool? Is it hard or soft, rough or smooth? You can just notice. Just noticing, paying attention. And now bringing the attention to the body breathing. Just this ordinary breath that your body is breathing right now, wherever it's most obvious to you. And that might be at the abdomen, maybe that sense of your waistband expanding and contracting with each breath. Or maybe it's most obvious at the chest, a sense of expansion and contraction. Or maybe it's most obvious at the nostrils, there's a sense of cool air coming in and warm air going out. Or elsewhere. The breath is always there. You can always bring the attention to the breath. You may notice the attention wandering, thinking about what I'm going to do next or what just happened or something else. You just notice that. And then come back to the breath, not holding on to wherever it went, but just letting it be whatever it was and coming back to the sensations of the body breathing. It's like the breath is home base. The mind wanders off, we notice, 
or bring it gently back to the breath. The breath is always there. You can count on that. Maybe noticing some breaths are deep and some are shallow, some are rough and some are smooth, some are pleasant, some are not, perhaps. Maybe the breath is interrupted by swallowing or sigh or something else like that. We just notice, just noticing, and noticing if the attention wanders off and bringing it gently back without judgment or harshness, just gently returning the attention to this breath. are noisy chairs, aren't they? <laughs> so what did you notice? It's all about noticing, right? What did you notice? Your knee doesn't hurt as much. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Very relaxing, right. Yeah, it can be very, very relaxing. Right, right. It's not always relaxing, but it can be relaxing. If we're kind of agitated when we sit down and meditate, it, it, it's not necessarily relaxing. So what you might want to do instead is do a movement meditation, maybe a walking meditation, or some easy stretches, um, paying attention in the same way, but now we we're paying attention to lifting the foot, placing it, lifting it, placing it. And that, that's, a, that's a time-honored form of meditation. Mindfulness meditation. Other things you notice, people noticed? Yeah, anybody else notice the mind wandering? Yeah, right, yeah, very common, very common, yeah. And so what do we do? Do we judge the mind? Eh, try not to. Um, I found myself once judging my judging. <laughs> I don't recommend that, you know? <laughs> So we can really get caught up in that. But yeah, the mind's going to wander. It seems to be what minds do. So, oh, oh, you went off. Okay, all right. I, and we can notice and we can bring it back. Oh, there you go again. Okay, come on back. Just very gently. Uh, one of the metaphors I use is a, it's like we're training a puppy, you know? And it doesn't help to yell at the puppy, right, when he goes wandering off. So you gotta go check out that bush and that bush, right? Yeah, you know, just come on back, come on back. Being gentle, cajoling him, bringing it back. So I asked, what did you notice? So you might notice getting hooked by thoughts, feelings, plans, to-do lists. I had one, one student in my class ask me, can I just stop the meditation and write down my to-do list? <laughs> I'd recommend not. Chances are that that thought about the thing you needed to add to your to-do list will come back to you afterwards. We might notice pushing away. I don't want to think about that. We might notice doing that. Um, we might notice judgment. We might notice being curious about our thoughts. And sometimes that ends up being, you know, following down the rabbit hole. You know, like you were saying, you know, where did that come from? Why did I think about that? And next thing you know, you know, we've gone off on some train of thought. So we can notice that that can happen. We might become aware of how impermanent so much of what arises is. And what I should add on next time I do this is a lot of what arises is unbidden. You know, I didn't ask for the sound of music to come into my head, right? <laughs> but there it is. 
okay, hi, I'm going back to the breath now, you know, or whatever, you know. So a, lo a lot of things can arise in your mind that you didn't ask to show up, you know. The Pizza Hut commercial, <laughs> or what that person said to you 20 years ago, you know. You can just, oh, okay, all right, there it is. Let it go, come back to the breath, let it go. Not holding on to it, but just letting it kind of float away. Okay? And this idea about thoughts being mental events, just mental events. They seem to run the show, but they're really just mental events, and they may or may not be true. So we might notice that. We might just notice awareness. Um, and of course, there's lots of other things you might notice. This is a really useful little diagram. OK, so up at the top, we hold our focus on the breath. No, 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 no. And then we get to here and we lose our focus. Oh, no. And then we become aware, right, that we've lost our focus. And then we come back. We aim our focus back. The only part of this in which there, you're not being mindful is this part. This moment that you noticed that the attention has wandered, that's a moment of mindfulness. That's just as important, just as important as when your attention is on the breath. You noticed what was going on. You noticed what the mind was up to. Ah, oh, there I went. Sound of music, Pizza Hut. <laughs> that friend 20 years ago, whatever, you know, just noticing. The breath is a handy anchor because it's always there. It's free. Um, it's a present moment physical sensation. Present moment physical sensations, any of the five senses, are very useful anchors for the attention because they're always going on right now. So that's one of the reasons why the um, taking a shower and eating and sitting in a traffic light, those are all opportunities for being present. Um, and it's fairly neutral. Right. Yeah, sometimes we fall asleep because we're sleep deprived. As a culture, we tend to be rather <laughs> sleep deprived. Um, but if you really, really don't want to fall asleep, there's a couple things you could do, one of which is to open your eyes. Right. <laughs> and the other is to actually meditate standing up. Okay. You're much less likely to fall asleep <laughs> 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 if you're meditating standing up. <laughs> But you can also just, you know, there's like a, you know, in the Buddhist tradition, there's a list of 50 different things that you can do when you're feeling sleepy. One of them is a walking meditation or other movement meditations. But the very end of the list is go to bed. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So other things, other questions people have on this kind of uh, meditation on awareness of the breath? Okay. All right. It's really it's is a, a go-to for many of us. Um, okay. So another really important meditation is cultivating compassion or loving kindness, um, and it's almost always included in a mindfulness practice course, in a mindfulness practice retreat, or anything of that sort. Uh, I don't think I've ever been on a retreat where they didn't where we didn't do loving kindness. Um, so what is a compassion practice? Deliberately cultivating friendliness and kindliness toward yourself and toward others. Okay? So should we do it? Okay. So we'll just do a short one and then we'll talk about it a bit and, and then we'll conclude. So once again, getting comfortable in your seat and taking a moment to just notice the body sitting here, letting your attention be grounded once again. And then shifting the attention to the breath, wherever the breath is most obvious to you. 
Noticing that sensation. And now, think about sending love and kindness, compassion to yourself. Maybe bring up an image of yourself or just imagine sending yourself wishes for your well-being and happiness. And you can do this with each breath. You could whisper a phrase such as, may I be happy, deeply, truly happy. May I be well in body, mind, and spirit. May I be safe from all harm. May I live with ease. You might want to use other phrases that might be more meaningful to you. Keep them short and general and without any qualifications. May I be wise. May I be strong. May I be free of suffering. Whatever is meaningful to you. And if part of you is not sure about sending these lovely wishes to yourself, just remember that you're just as deserving of this, these wishes as anyone else on this earth. Just as deserving of this level of friendliness, kindliness, gentleness. May I be happy. <coughs> May I be well. May I be safe. May I live with ease. And now bring to mind another person, maybe a teacher, a mentor, somebody who's supported you, helped you. and send them wishes for their well-being and happiness with each breath. May you be happy. May you be well. May you be safe. May you live with ease. And again, you can always use other phrases if you prefer. sending these wishes to this person who's helped you so much. With great gentleness, kindliness, friendliness. And now bring to mind somebody that you don't know very well maybe your mailman or male woman, maybe a clerk at the store or a bus driver that you've seen, somebody at work that you've never really talked to. But bring such a person to mind and send them wishes for their well-being and happiness. May you be happy. May you be well. May you be safe. May you live with ease, again and again, sending these wishes to this person whose story you don't even know. Wishing them happiness and well-being with each breath. And now sending these same wishes to everybody in this room, including yourself, those you know, those you don't know. May you be happy. May you be well. May you be safe. 
May you live with ease. And imagine sending this out the doors and windows to anybody here at St. Joe's or in Ipsy, Ann Arbor, back at Don Farms, in your neighborhood. Sending it further and further and further and further throughout the entire world. May all beings be happy. May all beings be at peace. So what was that like? What did you notice? Libby's favorite question. What did you notice? What were you aware of? It was comfortable. Yeah. Good. That's wonderful. It is very, it can be very, very difficult. That can be like the, ugh, the stumbling block. And there are different ways of playing with it where maybe at first you send it to somebody that you care about and then you imagine you standing next to that person and sending it to both of you and then just to you Cause, so you're gonna sneak up on it <laughs> but it's it it can be very difficult because we're very judgmental about ourselves and um, so it, that's all the more reason it's important to to tend yourself and be kind to yourself. Um, what I what I t what I teach is John's mindfulness-based stress reduction. I learned mindfulness at a Buddhist meditation center in Massachusetts, which is a pretty traditional American vipassana um, that Joseph Goldstein and Sharon Salzberg and Jack Cornfield started back in the early 70s. Yeah. He's got a wonderful book called Mindfulness. It's about yay thick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's, he's a little, he's like the intellectual of the group. Jack Cornfield is who I would recommend. Or John Kabat-Zinn. John's got a couple really lovely books. Uh, there's an introduction to mindfulness that's got a CD in it with guided meditations. <laughs> um, and Jack Cornfield also has a nice introductory book. Um, What's constructive for me is going to be different than what's helpful for you, you know. And so e each of us is going to be different in, in terms of what fits us best. I had somebody in one of my classes once, actually this was a group of recovering alcoholics, and she said, could you give me some advice on how to handle I'm going with my, my daughter to pick out her wedding dress, and, and I'm going, no, I can't give you advice about that. You know, I mean, she she knows her daughter. She knows herself. She knows how to be helpful and negotiate that relationship in ways I can't. You know, it's I think of mindfulness as helping us be our best selves, helping me be my best self, which is going to be different than for you or for you. This story I told about this aggravating person I was working with. I think that my practice of, of loving kindness was part of what helped me see her in a different way and negotiate that relationship in a different way. I, I mean, I see the, the, particularly the loving kindness and compassion carries over in our relationships with other people all the time. Um, and, and it's been tremendously helpful for me and I see it and I've, I've, heard, I've had people who take my class talking about how it's, it, it's affected their relationships at work, say. Um, there's a bunch of different, uh, there's about four or five different Buddhist groups in town. You can Google them. Um, the Ann Arbor Center for Mindfulness is who I'm affiliated with. Um, and we teach classes and we organize drop-ins around town. Um, there's about six 
drop-in meditations. They go on uh, throughout the week, and you can just go, you know. And you can go to our website, and there's a list of them at the Ann Arbor Center for Mindfulness website. Um, so if you want to practice with, it's helpful to practice with other people. It's just a little bit, you know, easier, and you've got somebody to talk to also about the experience. But um, a refuge recovery is like a Buddhist-oriented AA sort of recovery group, and they, um, I would Google them. Okay. Um, they, they have a meeting in a weekly meeting in uh, in Ipsy, and there's at least two, maybe more, in Ann Arbor. Yeah, per week, right, per week. Thank right. you. Sure. Well, it's a, it's a one-night thing, you know. They, they meet for an hour, and then meditate for a bit, and then talk a little bit, and then meditate some more. Cultivate. Do it. Just do it, you know. Pay attention. All right, thanks so much for coming. If you have any questions, let me know.